Let's take a look at another example, and this one again comes from the realm of the economy, and we're going to take a look at the Sarbanes-Oxley Act. And this Regulatory Reform Act, too, was put in place in the wake of a major financial scandal, specifically the accounting scandals of Enron, Tyco, and WorldCom in 2000-2001. In, so in 2002, the Sarbanes-Oxley Act came along and really rewrote all the rules of how uh, companies were supposed to report what was going on so that we would never see something like Enron happen again. One little problem with that. The people who were writing the rules and creating the very software that was supposed to put companies in, in the position of being able to comply with those rules were in on a much bigger scheme. This is something that whistleblower Richard Andrew Grove has pointed out at great length and which was expertly detailed in 2020 Hindsight Censorship on the Frontline, which is available for free viewing online and was summarized in my film literature in the New World Order episode on The Insider. 2020 Hindsight, Censorship on the Frontline, is the 2009 documentary by filmmaker Paul Verge of Divergent Films. It tells the story of Richard Andrew Grove, a former enterprise software sales rep who blew the whistle on a massive Wall Street corruption scheme centering on the Sarbanes-Oxley Act of 2002. Sarbanes-Oxley was passed in the wake of the Enron, Tyco, WorldCom accounting scandals to regulate and restore confidence in the financial services industry. The act requires certain financial service companies to buy specific compliance software, software that would theoretically make it impossible for Wall Street executives to erase any data related to their transactions. But what Richard Grove discovered was that the software he was selling, the very software that was supposed to stop fraud from occurring, in fact contained a backdoor that allowed that fraud to happen in a way that was completely untraceable. NASD was looking at our product and, and they wanted to use it internally. And one of the guys across the table says to me, hey, wait a minute, this product has a backdoor because right here where you're supposed to take this information and put it on the right once read many storage which is a type of permanent storage, he said there's this jar file and you can delete the jar file and then there's no evidence of that transaction whatsoever. So he was showing me across the table that there's a loophole, there's a backdoor in the software that allows nefarious transactions to go on and subsequently they didn't buy the software. They're like, this is this isn't worth the money. This is, this is not what it's supposed to be. And you should do something about that. Now I had management from my side in the meeting. And so I went to my managers afterwards and I'm like, what's this all about? And why, wh what's going on with this? And I was told not to talk about it. Given the staggering enormity of the information he had, Grove attempted to blow the whistle via the whistleblower protection provisions of the Sarbanes-Oxley Act. He even warned the Securities and Exchange Commission directly of what was happening but they not only failed to act on his information, they actually went and bought the very backdoor software he had warned them about for their own record keeping. I was surprised because I went to them expecting to take this evidence and at least have them look at it and say, there's something here, or there's nothing here. But when they said, you know, you could get in trouble for sharing this with us, we don't really want to know about this. If it's going on and people are at risk, then, you know, kind of so be it. And provably afterwards, soon there afterwards, the SEC released a press release announcing that they were using Legato's email extender product to guarantee the integrity of their financial transactions and their records and, the, and all the auditing and all the audit trails that need to be there to, uh, to work as in a transparent manner as they're supposed to do. Even after proving all of his allegations in a court of law to the satisfaction of the presiding judge, his whistleblower case was eventually dismissed on a fraudulent statute of limitations technicality. That level of corruption is almost unthinkable to the average non-criminally minded person, which is why the non-criminally minded person is so eager to call for more government regulation in the wake of every problem and scandal, because they think like non-criminals and they think other non-criminals will be running the scheme. But imagine if a truly psychopathic and determined criminal got into a position to be able to regulate the industry that they're in and that they want to succeed. 
The scale of what they will be able to accomplish is almost unthinkable. And certainly, if people are interested in the Sarbanes-Oxley Act and how that plays into Richard Grove's story and what he ended up doing to try to get the word out through the media and how he was shut down through that venue, etc., etc., once again, I highly recommend 2020 Hindsight Censorship on the Frontline, which gives a big picture understanding of these types of problems and how they are well, created and then uh, solved, quote unquote, by the uh, so-called regulations. Once again, this is not something that's coincidental. It's not something that just occasionally happens. This is something that is hardwired into the system. And the problem then becomes finding a real solution, because obviously the solutions that are laid out before us by the criminals are not going to be the solutions that will really get us out of the main problems. So, for example, when we look at the economic context and the, the financial collapse, the uh, we have these two sides of the story. We have the, the Webster's Harpleys of the world who are crying out for more government involvement and some FDR-like dictator to come along and put the economy in order and uh, make of that what you will. And then on the other side, we have the people saying, well, it's it's just we need more deregulation along the lines of Reagan and Thatcher. And we, we get put in this dialectic where it's a choice between this side of the argument and that side of the argument as if there is no other possible way of thinking about the argument. So, one thing that most people have absolutely no concept of is that when we're talking about these, this regulation versus deregulation debate, of course, we're not talking about the fundamental underlying nature of the way in which the economy is already inherently regulated. And there is already very, very much a government hand in that economy that is creating the conditions for the problem itself. And unless we understand that... We cannot hope to understand how to overcome this problem. So let's see if we can break through that paradigm of conditioning, which teaches us that the debate is really between those who want this particular type of regulation and those who want that particular type of deregulation, and look at the fundamental underlying issue, which is that the markets themselves are not free, and they have not been free for a very, very long time. And this is what creates the conditions that made the recent collapse possible. So on that note, let's turn to a very interesting commentary that Stefan Molyneux of Free...